The battle lines are drawn, and once again, somebody's saying, wait, be patient. If they knew how long it would be before all people could truly hear freedom ring. I wonder which end of that moral arc would they choose? I wonder if more would have walked in his shoes. This is what, this is what revolution looks like. You gotta get in and then stay in this fight. You've got to find a way to get in. Good morning and welcome to the second section of the Good Trouble Voting Rights Institute. And we are so pleased today to be joined by our two enlighteners and the um, co-leaders of Transformative Justice, Dr. Barbara Arnwine and attorney Daryl Jones. Thank you so much for being with us today and we will get started. Well, uh, first of all, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Lynn, so much for preparing this session and for uh, making sure that everybody is aware that we're having this uh, important Voting Rights Institute to bring current history to our past and to connect all of that so that people understand that the fight for voting rights is neither new nor is it uh, a, a tradition that's only in history. It is an ongoing fight. In fact, ta-da, here is the baton that I received uh, on behalf of the Transformative Justice Coalition because Daryl Jones, uh, Lynn Whitfield, Karen McRae, and so many others from the Transformative Justice Coalition were in Selma last uh, two weeks ago. And we not only did the bridge crossing with the Vice President of the United States, but we also had the march from Selma to Montgomery. And before I say another word, I want to give a big shout out, right, Daryl? Right, Lynn? to fire rolls to Ray uh, and to Senator Hank uh, Sanders of the state of Alabama for their incredible work in organizing this. Right, Daryl? Absolutely, Barbara. You're, you know, it was such a phenomenal experience to go through that with, uh, with you know, with Fire Rose and, and with Senator Sanders and the thousands of people that joined us in crossing the Selma, uh, the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. And what a great segue into today's Institute, you know, because we're talking voting rights. And when you talk about the birthplace of voting rights, you're talking Selma. And folks, I get, you know, what Barbara said is so accurate with the cross connection of everything historically that's going on to what's getting ready to happen on Monday when we have the begin the hearings for the first black woman to be nominated to the US Supreme Court. Let's be clear. There is a direct connection from Selma to what begins on Monday, because without that fight for voting rights, without the history of fighting for voting rights, we would not be standing in the position of arguing to have the first black woman sit on the U.S. Supreme Court and the nomination process beginning right now. Bar, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped up and you're right, it's all interconnected. Yes, you know, they say that the past is neither past nor is the past, uh, you know, uh, necessarily prologue, but it raises the question 
uh, you know, how the past informs our present. And it is so good that after 232 years of exclusion, the first African-American woman stands poised to be added to the Supreme Court. We're passing this baton on to everybody in our audience. Let's get this done, let's do the work because had not black women led the way, had not black men and the black community voted in such force, do you think there would be a nomination of a black woman to the Supreme Court? This is a direct corollary, a direct tie between our voting rights activism and engagement and involvement and sacrifice uh, and a return of seeing justice prevail. All right now, so let's get started. Let's go, Lynn, we're ready. First slide. This uh, whole session is calling acknowledging the victories of the past and preparing for the future. In this session, we wanted people to realize that voting has consequences and some of those consequences are very positive. And we wanted to really focus on what the vote has achieved and how we use the vote to fight for justice over these many centuries and most in the last you know, uh, century for voting rights and in the current you know, uh, time. And so we wanted to talk about, you know, last time we talked about reconstruction, right? We talked about the approximately 2000 black men who served in political offices in the South, over 600 in state legislatures, actually that number is pretty low, and 16 in Congress, two in the Senate, 14 in the House. But Daryl, what did that mean? Oh, Barbara, you know, it just opened things up from there. And, and then it came the backlash. The backlash yes. happens because once that progress is seen and experienced and they realize that there's a shift, that the, the Black folks and African Americans are beginning to see this power in what they're able to achieve, the backlash then becomes in place to try to suppress Blacks from voting, to stop that movement of that feeling of power and progress that's occurring. And so we get the Jim Crow laws that come out. And so we get the massacres that start across the country, all done to intimidate Black voters to stop them from exercising that franchise. And everybody remembers from our last sessions that one of the things we've emphasized is the George White farewell address to Congress in 1901. And remember, he was the last of the Black uh, Reconstruction Congress people. And he said, as he was being driven out of office because they had murdered, maimed, mutilated Black people in his area for voting, because they had uh, you know, come up with every voter suppression device you can think of to suppress the vote of blacks in his area. He knew that he could not win and he knew that the vote was you know, under such attack, but he predicted, what did he predict, Daryl? He said Phoenix-like. Phoenix, yep, Phoenix-like. Phoenix-like, the black vote would rise again, and he said in the black, the Negro would rise again in the presence of Congress. And sure enough, he was, he was prophetic because here we have in 1929, some 28 years later, the first black being elected to Congress post-Reconstruction, Oscar Stanton DePriest out of Illinois. And you're gonna see something really unique as we go through these slides. And that is that the majority of those people who are quote being um, elected post-Reconstruction are going to be from Northern states and Midwest states. And you're gonna still see a profound absence of elections of Congress people 
Black Congress people from the South. So let's go with the next slide. Go on, Daryl. Yeah, this is really exciting because you know, what we see then emerging coming out of the 30s and up through the 60s is that we see leaders like Adam Clayton Powell uh, out of New York that really becomes, uh, I think the time it was the line of the Senate, really takes on a, a very strong role and uh, what's happening. And we see members of Congress that are being uh, elected uh, in small numbers uh, throughout the North and Northeast uh, primarily. And, and that's a piece of, of what goes on, but there's more that goes on on our next slide. Uh, and before we get to that, I mean, we, this actually, we skipped over too much um, because there's a reason why there is this election process of blacks happening. Uh, people remember there's something called in the 1920s, there's World War I and a whole lot of black men go and serve in the army and they come back and they want to be involved uh, you know, as full citizens now. And they start you know, really advocating for their vote. But even before World War I, 1905 people, write that down, 1905, 1906, you have the founding of the NAACP, the entirety of the Niagara movement. Uh, that says, you know, we have been beaten down by this ugly, uh, you know, uh, you know, backlash to reconstruction. We've been denied our political rights, and we're going to get them back. And you have an incredible movement, the Niagara movement, the creation of the NAACP. But you also, you can't talk about how your know, blacks become politically powerful without talking not only about World War I, but the entirety of the Harlem Renaissance, Daryl, and the Garvey movement. I mean, black consciousness doesn't come out of nowhere. It's, it, it's you know, inculcated, it's built over years. And you have the incredible black consciousness of the quote, new Negro, because the new Negro ain't like no old Negro, allegedly. The new Negro fights back. The new Negro wants his rights and is not going to sit back and take it. So you got Alain Locke, you got Langston Hughes, you got George Schuyler, you got Ella Baker, you have Macaulay Mary, you got Dorothy Height, all of them in Harlem, uh, both the cultural artists and the political activists coming together in what becomes known as the Harlem Renaissance, but it is a movement throughout the United States, the totality of the United States of African-Americans awakening and demanding that they come out of the period of Jim Crow, demanding their rights. And this is such an important prelude to this period because otherwise this period makes zero sense. So you gotta understand what's going on. And what's so amazing about all these elections, Daryl, is that they're not only happening in that background and in that backdrop, but they're also happening during the depression uh, when economically African-Americans are suffering like never before, but they are considering themselves new Negroes who aren't gonna take it anymore. So that is why we get the uh, you know, election of somebody like an Adam Clayton Powell. And can I say something else that's gonna put these uh, elections in perspective is that look at Adam Clayton Powell and look at Bellamy, look at all the people who are being elected during this period and realize that part of that explosion is the intersection of the African diaspora. Because during this time, you got black people from the Caribbean uh, moving into Harlem. In fact, at one point during the 1920s and 30s, one half of all Caribbean born uh, Americans, uh, African Americans are living in Harlem living in New York. New York becomes like a center, a university of black consciousness. So it's no accident that we see uh, that explosion. But I, I really, you know, there's so much missing here and I'm so sorry people, 
because there's so many others who were elected during this period who bring you know, such great uh, knowledge and such great energy. But we do have here some of the really amazing leaders that come out of that fight after, after Selma Darrell, after the march. And you know, Barbara, one of the things that you say is that's really interesting uh, when we do this analysis and understanding what uh, the 1940s, the 65, uh, what we're actually dealing with and what we're actually yes. looking at. You know, we tend to look at it from the lens of where we stand today in 2022, rather than understanding and having necessarily a complete appreciation that you're maybe a generation and a half, maybe right. two generations removed from slavery. Less yes. than that, from legal lynchings removed, less than that from uh, from you know uh, uh, what is it Brown versus Board of Education and then public education and being taught to be able to have exactly. access to the public education. All of this is occurring right in this period. So when you yes. start moderating and trying to appreciate the uh, uh, the, the victories uh, of that point. You've, uh, of that period, you've got to remember the context of which the black folks are coming out of and what they have dealt with. They are just now having first generations of people that are going to, uh, that are getting high school educations, that are getting, right. uh, going to college and making it accessible to, to more African-Americans. This is the period that they're coming out. They're coming out of a period where we had uh, unions that were discriminating against the black uh, black person. Yes. Don't want them in there. And let's not even go, no, Barbara, I know you can go much more deeply into the black woman and what she was going through Woo! through that, that period of time. So all of this is what I think we have to contextualize when we're thinking about these elected officials that are breaking through, that are beginning to carry uh, the water over the line for the next, for the next, uh, for the next piece of history. Yes. Yes, and you know what's so important, everyone, is having done that march, uh, you know, to reenact and to continue that march from Selma to Montgomery, 54 miles. And let me tell you, footstep after footstep, Blacks were opening up the doors in 1965. But I do want people to understand that also in this period, remember there's World War II, and black men go to war again. Some 200,000 plus black men go to war and fight for the United States in segregated union, uh, units and divisions and are as harassed and, and uh, persecuted by their own uh, as uh, white you know, uh, Americans as they are you know, by the race, uh, racism in Europe in other places. But I want people to understand that all of this, all of this culminates, all of this culminates. There is no 1965 without Emmett Till. There mm -hmm. is no 1965 Voting Rights Act without the activism of Africans, uh, descendants in the United States to coming together, the Caribbean awareness, the African awareness, the uh, African descendants of slavery awareness, all of this coming together to produce a cauldron of change, an explosive cauldron of change. So here we have, after the uh, Voting Rights Act of 65, you got Shirley Chisholm, uh-oh, watch out now. She said, I am what? I'm bought and I'm bossed. Oh, she said, if there's not a chair at the table, you better bring your own. Oh, yes. And now we sisters now say, hey, we create our own table. So you got to join us uh, at the table. So there's so much. You see there, Carolyn, uh, Carol Mosley Braun, the first African-American woman senator from Illinois. And remember, Shirley Chisholm from New York. Uh, look at these non, you know, Southern states. And then you have, of course, in the 70s, you have the amazing Barbara Jordan uh, being elected out of uh, Texas. Uh, so, and, and you know, speaking so powerfully during the uh, Nixon uh, you know, proceedings, speaking so powerfully about our constitution and people are going, what? There are black women lawyers who know something about the constitution and being shocked. Uh, and of course, you know, she's prior to Carol Mosley Braun. And, uh, cause, and so I, because Carol Mosley Braun comes out of that 
whole re reaction to um, the horrid, horrid um, confirmation of Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court, when so many women were shocked to realize that there were no women senators, period, uh, so few uh, in the Congress. And that led to a, um, a wave of elections of women uh, to the court, I mean, to the uh, Congress and Carol Mosley Brown comes in on that wave after you know 1992. Uh, so I just want people to really understand, you know, all of this history. And you got people like Augustus Hawkins, and you have so many other amazing people being elected. Next slide. And don't and forget then, about Senator Edward yes. Brooke, Senator Edward Brooke that, that came in through the Senate through yes. uh, Massachusetts from 67 to 79. We gotta we gotta include him. In that, I in mean, that. because he was amazing, right? Because he's a Republican and he's, you know, strong as a Republican. And what's amazing about, you know, Barbara Jordan is she's one of those new Democrats, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So there's, you know, so much to be said. And, um, you know, we don't want people to think that we're trying to skip over too much history because there's huge history being made during this time and Black uh, people are leading the way for voting rights. They're you know, uniting with uh, Latinos who are beginning to really demand you know, that we correct all the uh, injustice against Latinos and Asian voters are coming into their own and youth voters have gotten their uh, you know, amendment in the 1970s, uh, the 26th amendment so that they can have the right to vote at 18. I mean, there's just so much happening with the vote in this period. Um, and then of course we come to the current era, the 21st century. Oh my goodness, Daryl, look at those faces. Uh, did we have something to do with this? <laughs> faces of diversity, faces of diversity, love it. Yes, um, and I mean, uh, we um, have so much joy because uh, if we did this slide in reverse order, you have Barack Obama. Now, Daryl, I remember speaking before the NAACP uh, at one of their national political meetings. And uh, I would say it would have been in the uh, early 90s. Uh, and I did a projection of political empowerment and projected that African Americans would be able, it would probably been in the late 90s, would be able to uh, lead a coalition of uh, people of color and young progressive voters of all races and others in creating uh, a, a political environment in which they would elect a black president. Daryl, the people looked at me like I was the craziest thing they had ever seen. <laughs> Because the idea of a black president within the next 10 years, yes, because I said within the next 10 years, was inconceivable. They thought I had totally lost my mind. And, um, but, you know, the trend lines were there, they were clear to me. And so when uh, Barack Obama stepped forward, and said, I'm gonna run for office, people need to remember that it wasn't embraced. There were huge uh, schisms and fights within the black community about whether or not it was time. Isn't that fascinating? Because there was the same fight when Brown versus Board of Education uh, within the legal community. People were saying, is it time? Well, they don't understand that there's no time but God's time. And when he's ready, everything happens. And so Barack Obama uh, you know, got out there, he ran, he won, he became the first African-American elected to, the, to be president. He wasn't the first to run, Shirley Chisholm, many others ran. Uh, he was uh, Jesse Jackson, uh, you know, really you know, run Jesse, run. There were so many movements uh, for Black political power during this time in the Congressional Black Caucus is really whipping it up with Ron Dellums and so many other amazing leaders in that caucus. So it made sense that once again, we were an era of consciousness where people would say it's time. And then we had um, 
the amazing uh, 2020 election. Whoa, and Daryl, you know what we had to do to make that election happen. Right, but I wanted to step back for just a second, Barbara, because when you were walking through the analysis with then Senator uh, Barack Obama, you know, yes. one of the stories that I, uh, that I share uh, periodically is that you know, during that 2007 run, when, uh, when uh, Senator Obama was then running for president, uh, yes. I had the opportunity uh, and at that point, a lot of the African-American community was supporting Hillary Clinton. Believing That's that correct. So much for the African-American community. And I can recall having conversations with groups of African-Americans that were saying that it ain't going to happen. There's no way. America's not God. America, America is not ready. And having that conversation with them and, and, and just extolling the, the the philosophy that I hope you're telling your children that they can't be what they want to be, that they're, because that's Ooh. what you're doing right now. And I can recall going to a fundraiser for then Senator uh, uh, Barack Obama in Washington, D.C., was it maybe a hundred or so of us. And I didn't know who all the characters were, all the people that are or Barbara that were in the room. And I can recall <laughs> sitting and waiting. And I was talking to this elderly gentleman and his wife who were just so, so nice. And they were telling me they were from Georgia and from Atlanta. And we were just <laughs> talking and chatting away for a good 20 minutes. And I was telling them everything that I knew about Atlanta and what things I thought they should do down in Atlanta. It turned out to be Reverend Joseph Lauer. <laughs> yes. Right. And I had the opportunity to actually go over and to meet Senator Barack Obama and I was told as he was preparing to leave that he needed to meet Joseph Lowry. And so ah. I walked Senator Barack Obama over to Reverend Joseph Lowry. And Barbara, I sat back and what happened just blew my mind. Senator Obama, this is the connection between the past and the present. Senator Obama took Joseph Lowry by the hand as Joseph Lowry was seated in his chair. He got down on one knee and said to Joseph Lowry, I just want to thank you because of what you did in the 1960s and standing up for voting rights has enabled me to stand today to run for the presidency of this country. Folks, that's the connection between the history and the present, the commitment of the history and the commitment of the present and how it all comes together. So Barbara, I just had to get that piece in. Oh, uh, you gave me goosebumps, uh, you know, because uh, chills, uh, you know, to just think about how God used you in that moment to connect those two great men. And as everybody knows, um, Joe Lowry would go on to give the, uh, you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, address uh, at uh, Obama's inauguration. So that yes. friendship would blossom, would grow. Yes. Thank you for being the instrument of creating that. Um, I also want people to know that, you know, in 2020, uh, you know, we had to come out, you know, I created the map of shame in 2011. We're gonna talk about that soon, about the backlash. Uh, that was beginning to happen because people were in fact saying it is too early for a black man. And people, and uh, you know, we know that there's some people who will never think there's a time for a black man to be president, but uh, Barack Obama's presidency met with a lot, a lot, a lot of reaction, uh, but we were determined and we kept voting. We kept doing what we should do. And in 2016, the combination of all that voter suppression all of that, um, uh, uh, all of you know the 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 you know uncertainty around the candidacy of um, Hillary Clinton, the sexism, all of that came to culmination and resulted in a um, low turnout for the first time in many many years of African American voters. Uh, and well, let's say not just turnout, really, it's how their votes were counted, a lack of counting of many of the ballots of African-Americans. Uh, and we had a, you know, a Trump victory. Uh, yet we kept working and people were saying, oh, well, you know, it's all over 2020. You got a, 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 a pandemic. There's no way you could win during a pandemic. And what did we say, Daryl? What did oh, we it, say? Absolutely. We're going to be out there getting people registered to vote and getting them out to the voting place to get them done. And we're going to do voter caves. We're going to find a way yes. to get it done. Yes, Absolutely. We, came up with, 
new creative tools. Uh, we had to teach people how to vote by mail. We had to teach people how to get drop boxes. Uh, and we did that in many states. And we, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're very active, and we're very proud to say here that we play the huge role. And when I say we, the Transformative Justice Coalition, play the huge role in supporting all those magnificent organizers in Georgia, and resulting in the election of Warnock and Ossoff, uh, because we always say that uh, TJC doesn't have to be partisan. All we got to do is make sure people have their ability to vote. Let them do what they do. And we're confident that people will make the right choices and decisions in, in the elect electoral process. That's why we hate voter suppression so bad, because it's unnatural and it's meant to be uh, uh, you know, putting your hand on the scales and making it unequal. Now, Kamala Harris, yes. Oh my goodness, we were with her in Selma. Uh, it was a, what a pleasure, Daryl, for us to you know take our pictures, but also for you know I was part of that meeting of of uh, leaders uh, with her and talking about what we need, uh, and afterwards you know addressing the nation you know from her pulpit. Uh, what a what a beautiful day we had with her and her being the first African American woman. Asian woman, 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 period, to be elected vice president of the United States. What an incredible honor that is to even to this day think about what voters did. Voters made that happen. Voters, she was not appointed, she was elected. Next slide. Next slide. Ah, <laughs> oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Uh, something happened in 2011 and it was called the um, Map of Shame. But let me uh, tell people that after uh, Barack, uh, President Barack Hussein Obama was elected uh, in 2008, we immediately start, saw states adopting new restrictive laws. Uh, Indiana adopt, adopts in 2009 the first, the first vicious, ugly voter ID, photo ID law, saying that you have to show a photo ID. Now remember, states have been requiring IDs all the time of some sort or the other, you know, like you could bring your gas bill, you could just bring your drive, you know, you could bring whatever you had and it would be accepted. There were like most states accepted over 26 forms of ID, but Indiana said only one, you must show your uh, driver's license or state issued ID or you cannot vote after centuries of people voting without it. And, um, that was the first immediate re reaction. But then in 2010, during the midterm elections, 33 states changed their, became solidly GOP. And I'm just saying that that's what they did. I'm just relating facts. Um, became solidly GOP led state legislatures. And that because 25 million people who voted in 2008 sat out the midterm election, sat it out and did not vote. And as a consequence, by the, uh, January of that year, led by ALEC, the American Legislat Legislative Exchange uh, Committee and many others, uh, they, uh, state, the state legislatures started passing voter suppression laws as emergency legislation, jamming it through the uh, uh, legislature uh, within weeks uh, after the new year started in 2011. And I caught up with it and started telling people about the map of shame, what was going on with this voter suppression. And as you can see, those are the red states and the states that have passed uh, restrictive laws. The yellow states were the states that uh, were considering it. Uh, and the blue states had um, 
you know, pending laws and the white states had nothing going on yet. So you can just see how rapidly this happened because this map is April, April of, of 2011. Uh, so I just wanted to people to know that, that you know, non-voting, not voting has consequences. Next slide. And you know, Barbara, uh, as, as we move into, you know, the 61 forms of voter suppression, you know, what we want to be certain that everyone recognizes is the pattern that we've spoken of previously. That, yes. You know, 1865, when, they, when you have the right to vote, and 1867, you have the backlash uh, that yes. occurs. Press it. The 1960s, you have an extension of that. When we start talking about the Jim Crow and the beans in the jar and the bubbles in the bar of soap and all of the voter suppression techniques that were then being used. We then came up through uh, 2000 through 2008 with the election of Barack Obama. And then we come back with another pattern of voter suppression activities that leading up to your, your, uh, your, your, uh, your map of shame and, and what then is happening. They've taken off the hoods and they put on this legislature, right? It starts to try to legislate what they were trying to do to try to suppress uh, African-Americans from being able to vote. And that's what leads into the 61 forms of voter suppression. You know, that's what leads into so many different pieces. The 61 forms, Barbara, of, of voter suppression really deals with various, and there's more than 61 now, right? Yes, the, many more. The, the 61 forms are various methods and methodologies that were being used by uh, election officials, by state legislatures to try to suppress, to hold back to uh, make it more difficult to, to disenfranchise uh, voters of colors and particularly black voters and those that were formerly, uh, formerly incarcerated and the returning citizens. All of this was being done uh, post, all, post 2011 up through today and beyond. We even, we would add, Barbara, if we were doing the, uh, the, the updating this voter suppression, right, our 61 forms of voter suppression, I know we'd be well over 200 because we know in Arizona and Tennessee, they're now trying to do what? They're trying to say, you need the fingerprint to be able to vote in person for an in-person voting, fingerprinting. Imagine being a person who is a returning citizen who might be on probation or any other, and they're asking, the government is asking for your fingerprint for you to be able to vote. And if you're wrong, as they do in many states, including the state of Florida, if you're wrong in your, in your ability and thinking that you have the right to vote, we're going to uh, charge you with a, with a felon and send you back to prison. That's part of this whole thing with the forms of voter suppression uh, that exists. And Barbara, I know you want to go a little more deeply into it. Oh, listen, I mean, there's so much. You know, I want to say to everybody listening, you know, we have said that you need to read the George White farewell address to Congress. We have said that, you know, we need to study, you know, all these amazing Black Congress people who come into office, you know, give these assignments to your children uh, to study uh, these amazing people. But, and we talked about, you know, so much, but I also want to say that if you haven't, you make it your business to go to Montgomery, mm. make it your business to go to the EJI, Equal Justice Institutes, a um, new museum that opened up in October and walk through that and go through it. Make sure you go not only to the museum, but you go to the memorial. In fact, they now make it where you gotta buy the tickets jointly uh, and go to the, what they call the Peace and Justice Memorial, which is the lynching memorial and go to it see it, uh, you know, and understand when you walk through not only the economic and social racial controls that were put on Blacks, but also see how many people are in there because they voted and they advocated for voting rights, they advocated for union rights, they advocated for, you know, they, they tried to just be treated as humans. You got to see that and realize when you see those, you know, documented 5,000 to 6,000 lynchings, please understand that that has nothing to do with all the disappeared. The thousands and thousands and thousands of black people who were murdered and their bodies were never found. Just remember everybody when they were looking for Chainer, Cheney, Swerner and Goodman. Mm -hmm. Yes, that they, uh, in that 
earthen dam. As they were looking for them, they found 14 other bodies of people who had been killed and hidden, black folks that they had murdered and, and uh, you know, sunk there. Remember the same that uh, Emmett Till was thrown in a river. So we just don't want to forget that. Tulsa, today they don't even know the count in Tulsa of all the slain because their bodies were what, Daryl, dumped. Dumped mm -hmm. in the river, dumped in mm -hmm. uh, mass graves yeah. and all of it's, these things. So, yeah. so we don't have an accurate history, but please, people, go to Montgomery. See what's happened there. Know our history. Understand it deeply. Don't be shocked. Don't be saddened, but take strength from our pain. T turn our pain, what Daryl, into power. Uh, mm -hmm. and to advocate. So these 61 forms of voter suppression, as Daryl said, are just, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, nothing but a bookmark because there are so many other pages to this story and so many other forms of voter suppression that come up every single day. So it's our obligation to show them that just like our ancestors fought, we can fight. Right, Next and slide. you know, Robert, as we go to the 61 forms of voter suppression uh, and we go to the next slide, I always say I lay at the doorstep of the Supreme Court. What yes, here we come. Able to do with regards to suppressing people's right to vote, particularly people of color. It came through Shelby versus Holder because in yes. Shelby versus Holder, that came out of Alabama. Shelby, Alabama, was the uh, was the first time one of the first time the Supreme Court actually said, you know what, states discrimination uh, uh, is over. It's all over. You can go here. Don't worry about racism. Don't worry about it. It's over. Do what you want to do. You know, we're, we're going to strike down that portion of it that's going to call for uh, your, your uh, electoral laws to be reviewed uh, by the federal government. So you go ahead and, and, and do what you're going to do. And within moments, within hours of the Shelby versus Holder decision coming down, we had states that were enacting these strict uh, measures with regards to driving license and, and ID identification requirement. And that really laid the doormat for what was to come in the fight, in the fight over uh, voting, uh, voting rights and, and the suppressing the rights of particularly African-Americans and brown folks to be able to exercise their right to vote. All that new restrictive voting legislation was at the doormat that was welcome in through Shelby versus Holder. And Barbara, I know you want to go more deeply into Brinovich and the out of precinct voting and ballot harvesting. I, I, I know you want to talk about that Native American stuff that was going on down in Arizona. Well, you know, um, you know, first of all, thank you, Daryl, because, you know, Shelby versus Holder 2013, June 25th of 2013, a day that uh, resonates in infamy uh, in the civil rights, voting rights, uh, justice community, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, once again, the Supreme Court leading the suppression the legal suppression of African Americans. I mean, there's a notorious history of you know our laws being used to restrict our full participation in society. Everybody has heard of the notorious uh, Dred Scott decision, saying that blacks were uh, had no rights that a white man had to respect. Uh, and that we were not, uh, you know, uh, citizens of the U.S. And then, of course, we had to have a civil war and have those amendments, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, to correct uh, that, that injustice. Uh, and but still, the court uh, in the civil rights cases in the 1880s, uh, you know, start, uh, struck down, you know, some of the best provisions of the of those amendments and did not extend them to full equality. And then we had the court in 1895, uh, you know, Shelby, you know, we, uh, Plessy, uh, you know, we have the Plessy versus Ferguson case uh, that says separate but equal was, you know, the law of the land and that that was the best. So, you know, so the court has led so many. And also I always say, Daryl, that people understudy the court, the cases in the 1920s, the U.S. versus 10 case, T-H-I-N-D, the U.S. versus Osaka case, uh, which basically where the Supreme Court of the United States is defining who's white. Mm -hmm. And why are they defining who's white? Because they're defining who's privileged. 
I mean, and they say that. I mean, you know, when people say, well, they, you know, this whole term of white privilege is just made up by black folks. No, the Supreme Court talks about it in these decisions. Who's privileged? They have certain rights because they're white. So they have greater rights than Asians, greater rights than um, than blacks, you know, greater rights than Latinos. All of this, the court defines it. These cases aren't taught. You never probably heard of them, but they're critical to, you know, this whole era. So this this suppression, that little brief period of 1954, the Warren Court of 1954, uh, you know, that brief period of history where the court was halfway good uh, between 1954 you know, to uh, roughly 1971, uh, it was so brief and people don't understand that. And ever since then, the court has been back on this tirade of, you know, of uh, injustice rulings. And so, uh, so it was, you know, so important for us to understand, you know, Shelby versus Holder and that backdrop, and that uh, that it was yet a continuation of this racial denial of trying to pretend like racism doesn't exist in our society, trying to say, oh well, we don't deny that it exists, but we just don't think there's enough proof, proof, proof. Uh, you know, I mean, come on. Uh, so it's just, you know, part of the gaming. Of of uh, of you know uh, racial privilege in our society. Remember that the time the Shelby versus Holder is decided, twelve hundred one thousand two hundred jurisdictions were under a requirement that they could not pass any law, practice, or procedure without. Uh, review to make sure it was non-discriminatory because they had a record and a history of discrimination. There were nine states within that 1,200 jurisdictions uh, that were covered. And not surprisingly, in this new modern era of voter suppression, those nine states are the states that are leading the voter suppression today. Brownovich versus D uh, the, uh, the Democratic National Committee is a case from July of uh, 2020, uh, where the Supreme Court uh, viciously uh, upheld um, uh, you know, two uh, voter suppression laws from Arizona and basically limited the scope and application of Section 2, which is the liability section of the Voting Rights Act. So they already attacked Section 5 by removing the coverage uh, of different states. And now they come in and they make it harder to prove discrimination. And they actually argued, wait a minute, everybody, they actually argued that even though some practices were clearly discriminatory, mm -hmm. I want you to take this in now, that even though some practices clearly had a discriminatory impact, that it didn't count because people had other options of where, of other options to vote and other ways that they could uh, use practices that were non-discriminatory. Since when does the court say that discrimination is okay here as long as you got an option there? Come on, I mean, you talk about Plessy versus Ferguson, really do. Here we go. There. You, you know, you're absolutely uh, correct, Barbara. And you know, and what's interesting is that we see this this evolvement, right, from Shelby to Brinovich to the next slide, Lynn, to what happens then in the legislatures, right? Is that we end up having like, what is it, uh, 34 pieces of legislation that's introduced through 19 different states throughout the country that's all oriented towards suppressing the right, limiting the access to the ballot, making it more difficult for people to be able to vote. And let's be clear, we're not just talking about Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, Texas. And no, look Southern. at that map. Look at the map. We New York is in there. You know, Iowa is in there. Nevada is in there. Come on, so, Montana, you don't even have people of color. It's okay. that, you know, but you hate your Native Americans so much, huh? Right, right, right. So, you know, this is this is the outbreak that you then see happening across the country of these states that have passed and have enacted. Now, we're not talking about ones that are proposed. These are passed and enacted. And if you want to know the impact of it very quickly, I'll just lift up Texas. If we lift up Texas right now, because yeah. we know that in Texas, they just had their primary election. March 1st. 
March the 1st, they just had their primary election. And we know from the 2020 uh, general election in Texas that they had a, uh, a rejection rate for vote by mail of about 1%. We know now that for the primary for 2022, that the, the uh, rejection rate for their vote by mail was above 20%, was above 20%, and by some estimates, even a little bit higher. That's the impact of, these, of this legislation uh, that's going on across this country in terms of suppressing people's access to being able to vote. Uh, Barbara, did you want to speak on this any further? Oh, yes. You know, 13% statewide, and in some counties, 30 to 40% rejection rates, mm -hmm. uh, especially the counties with heavy African American and Latino populations, because it's Latino. Uh, voters who have been denied here. And remember, we're also dealing with gerrymandering uh, in these states, Alabama, Texas, Florida, Georgia, uh, North Carolina, we, uh, Ohio, we got you know gerrymandering going on also where, and we'll talk about that in a future uh, uh, session. Moving on to the next uh, slide, please. This is anti, you know, there's a correlation between all these uh, anti-voting rights laws, these anti-CRT, you know, don't want you to teach black history, women's studies, LGBTQIA rights, and uh, this anti-black uh, voters, uh, Black Lives Matters movement, uh, protesting and other kinds of laws. I mean, there's a whole racial control going on in all of these states and look at them. You can see them viciously while people are hungry, while you know food insecurity is at a record level, while healthcare is at a record uh, you know, crisis level. These states are doing nonsense, trying to, uh, to eviscerate and to deny First Amendment rights. Next slide. And this, uh, yes, and this is the racial, uh, you know, trying to get rid of race, what they call critical race theory, meaning that they just don't want you to teach black studies. Uh, they, in fact, they stand up, Daryl, and talk about, oh, you know, Dr. King, he, you know, taught about the content of our character. And he wasn't into you know, all this race, affirmative action, et cetera, et cetera. They don't even want you to teach Dr. King's books. Come on. They don't want you to teach Maya Angelou's poetry. They don't want you to teach Cesar Chavez existed. They don't want you to teach any of this. This is vicious, uh, you know, whitewashing of American history, instead of being honest about our history, because our history makes us stronger. The good news here is that new polling data shows that Americans by overwhelming percentages, over 80% say teach the real history. Next slide. Right. And the other piece that becomes really interesting uh, as we uh, transition from there, Barbara, is that you know they all embrace Congressman John Lewis. They love yes, John Lewis. Please. The question is, would they allow the history of John Lewis to be taught in those schools? There's a struggle for voting rights to be caught, to be taught under their uh, theory of criti critical, against their critical race theory. And the answer is no. So it, no. it's very interesting, the, the, you know, just the, um, the confusion that they have uh, intrinsically within their intellectual uh, analysis uh, of trying to put out what is critical race theory. The gender, gerrymandering and the redistricting, we've spoken of that a little earlier, uh, how the gerrymandering has been being used to try to, another method of, of suppressing a uh, voter so that you're voting for someone that you, you can't uh, use the full power of your vote because they have watered it down by expanding you and putting you in a district uh, where uh, those of like minds are not together and electing a representative that would be uh, a representative of your mindset, of your values, of what you want to have done. That's a large part of what we see, we're see. we seeing happening. We're seeing some fight back, right, Barbara? Because what we've seen at least one gerrymandering that's been that's been slapped down by the state court. Uh, but yes. you know, but uh, it is a process and it is a, a large part of what we see happening across the country right now. And we'll talk about this more you know, in our future, um, uh, you know, uh, presentations because there's so much to gerrymandering and we can give you know, more examples and explain cracking, packing and stacking mm -hmm. and all of the various forms of gerrymandering and, and what does it mean to have commissions and et cetera. We, we, there's so much here. We'll talk about that next time. Uh, moving on. 
Um, these are just a reminder that this fight of, against voter suppression is still going on. Uh, that as of this year, 27 states are still considering 250 bills with voter restrictive provisions in them. 88 are rollover bills from the 2021 session. Uh, at least 32 states have introduced um, uh, roll over 399 bills to expand voting access. So the good news is that as some people are trying to undermine the right to vote, other people are fighting to expand that right. And that mm -hmm. is what we believe in and that we need to make sure that we fight against this, what we call electoral subversion, where they're now trying to introduce bills in 13 states, 41 bills to make it hard to count the votes uh, and to uh, take over from local uh, boards of elections, the power to count the vote and put it into legislative committees, partisan legislative committees, just totally undemocratic. Next slide. And one of the good things was that as we encourage people, we had a little typo that was in the last slide. It's actually the Brennan Center. And we encourage people to go to the Brennan Center yes. and to the website to look at information because they're always providing updated of researched information for what's occurring around the country. And as we prepare for the primary elections, we've talked about Texas that has already occurred. We know that you know throughout the summer and into November, uh, we're going to have elections that are occurring around this country. And you're gonna see the impact of a lot of the suppression legislation that we've talked about being in place. But we don't go on negative, we go positive. We, we are coming up with ways to combat, to learn, to teach, to prepare, so that these suppression legislations that's out there, that we're able to be certain that we are meeting what needs to be met for our voters to be able to vote and for their votes to be able to be cast without incident. Barbara, did you wanna go deep, more deeply into the primary elections? Yes, please, everybody, look at this map. These are the upcoming primary elections. As you will notice, uh, all the ones that are in red, um, You'll notice that there's, uh, you know, the ones that have already happened, uh, the little ones in pink, uh, there's a few with old stupid Texas, you know, going first, I'm sorry, but they know, they knew better, uh, you know, having people having to register by January, uh, you know, they knew that that was going to suppress the vote, that's why they did it, uh, but look, that the majority of the uh, primaries are coming in May, in June, in August, and in September, please everybody let's make sure that we're part of that core uh, out there making sure that people know that it's time to vote and when to vote uh so we'll talk more about that about how to organize voters in upcoming sessions next slide and never forget midterm elections count that's when most of your state legislatures are uh are up for consideration. That's when you still got big Congress, you still got big issues around the Senate elections that are happening also. So your governors and all your local races, midterm, 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 vote. Be ready to vote this year. Don't sit it out. Don't think that you only vote for president. Vote all the time, every time that you have an opportunity. Next slide. And we need you to be an activist for this voting concept, to get out there and to agitate. I think it was Derek Bell and Faces at the Bottom of the Well in his book that said, agitate, agitate, agitate. We need folks well, he to was be... taking that from Frederick Douglass from <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's right. That's true. Uh, we need folks to be activists. We need you to get out and encourage people to vote. You know, it wasn't just the Boston Tea Party that was activist. It, it, it wasn't just during slavery, the folks that, that were teaching slaves to read that was illegal, that were activists. You know, it wasn't just Harriet Tubman that was an activist and freeing Blacks. We need you to be an activist today and being certain that people meet the needs to be able to be able to vote. You know, you're, you're being an activist when you're using any direct action to be able to facilitate the change for a positive and an inclusive democracy. That's what we're about. That's what we're encouraging you to, to do and to get out and encourage people to vote. Barbara, did you want to go more deeply? Yes, next slide. Um, you know, we want examples of direct action. You see it, yeah, that's me. 
<laughs> now, I don't know, Daryl, how in the world did I end up with the flag? Uh, because <laughs> Daryl loves to carry the American flag. And somehow I got the flag because Daryl's got the bullhorn. And we, we are not telling you to do something that we don't do. We're out there, we're agitating. Just, um, you know, if you go to the far, uh, if you see the middle slide, uh, you see there's Marcus Arbery from the Arbery family, uh, the Ahmad Arbery family. And there we are with the, uh, uh, with the head of the Selma Commission. Uh, this is all from Selma. You see the Pettus Bridge in the background. And you also see Dr. Steele, of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, one of our partners. And you see Daryl and I are sporting, no, we're not sporting no Italian uh, suits. We're sporting our John Lewis Good Trouble shirts. Uh, then the next side you see, those are some of the children. Every time we protest, uh, we have multiple generations uh, involved because it's not just about the, elders it's not just about those of us who are you know active in our generation but it's about future generations and we love the fact that our children love to come out and lead the marches right daryl absolutely and i love the little girl with her fist in the air and what's she wearing barbara she's wearing her john lewis t-shirt you got it you got it absolutely and our next slide, slide. and uh so that was you know the biz crossing and uh this Look at this. Look at the people. 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 Look at the there we go. Look at your that was just Jackson. There we go. And we saw people, and people coming out saying we got to vote, we got to vote, we got to vote. Look at the people, look at the people, because this is our future. There we go, Barbara Jarrett and Marcus. So we just want people to know that we're, not, we're, not, we're not just talking, we're about activism. We're about getting it done. We're about reaching out to the people. You see Daryl going to jail. Uh, you know, here in Arizona, and you know, we went to jail in uh, DC in DC last year. You see us standing hand in hand with Latasha Brown and and Will, Reverend uh, Re William Barber. You see us uh, with the Abad Orberry family, who we brought to Selma. All you know, sixteen members to be part of this. You see me standing there at the last day of the march from Selma to Montgomery. Uh, we're about real activism because change doesn't happen with you sitting on your hands. Change happens because you get into the streets, right, Daryl, and make the Absolutely. change. Next slide. And you know, there are all types of activism. We encourage people to get involved. Uh, you know, when we were in Atlanta, uh, down in Georgia, down in uh, Southeast Georgia and all over the state of Georgia, we had a telephone bank that was going on in 2020 and we reached, how many different people did we reach by telephone bank? 550,000 people, Daryl. And if you don't like talking on the phone, we also had a postcard writing uh, campaign that went into uh, all of Georgia. How many people did we reach by phone call, uh, by, uh, by uh, postcard, Barbara? Another 560,000 people. This is the activism that we advocate. This is what the activism that we ask everyone to be a part of. Everybody, as Reverend Jackson loves to say, everybody can do something. And that's yes. what we encourage you to do is to do your something. Whatever your something is, is what we need you to do. And Barbara, how do people get involved? What are some of the suggested ways? Ah, uh, there you go. Be part of election protection. Voter education is primary 
primary, primary to educate voters. Voter registration is, old, is important, but it, it should not be your only goal because if you only register voters, only 30% will come out if you don't do voter contact, if you don't do the voter education, if you don't do it, become a poll worker, assist with returning citizens and um, you know, to adjust you know, the criminal uh, justice impacted persons, that's a, a error in how that's uh, written. But we want you to understand that we will be running Transformative Justice Coalition, a project in the states of North Carolina, the state of Wisconsin, the state of Pennsylvania, the state of Arizona. We're going to be running really strong programs to restore voting rights to people who are eligible. Votercating is so important because it makes people aware that it's time to vote and that their vote is desired. Candlelight vigils to recognize our history. Use your artistic talents. We need people who are great artists who can use their singing and their dancing and their uh, drawing and their paintings, uh, all kinds of, you know, their online activism, uh, that all of that counts. And uh, I, in our future, we'll talk more about the churches because we got a whole presentation for churches and how churches can get involved. Next slide. So we encourage everyone to contact the Transformative Justice Coalition. You can reach us a number of ways. If, if you're uh, on Facebook, we're at, you know, come to our Facebook page at the Transformative Justice Coalition. We're available on Twitter at TJC underscore DC. We're available on Instagram at TJC underscore DC. We're also, you can reach us through www.tjcoalition.org. We're here, we're available, we have resources. Come check us out, come uh, connect with us, and please, whatever you do, wherever you are, get involved, get off the sidewalks, get into the streets, make good trouble in 2022. Barbara, some closing words? Yes, I just want to, you know, uh, you know, people, please get involved, uh, help us uh, turn out on Monday at 10 on the steps of the Supreme Court, uh, turn out at 1230 for the voting rights and Supreme Court rally that's being led by the Progressive National Baptist Convention. You heard me, the black ministers are getting out there and we're so uh, grateful to Daryl Gray and all the other activists who are heading that one up in Washington, DC. Uh, so, and you don't have to be in DC, you can, call your congressperson. You see that right there where it says call, call your senator right now. I don't care who your senator is at 202-224-3121 and tell them to vote to confirm Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. Post on your social media uh, and make sure people are aware. Write an op-ed, letters. Do you remember to tag or share uh, on this page so that people know that we are doing this education. We really love you. We appreciate you. It means so much that you've given us your Saturday. And yes, we went long today, but we had a whole lot to cover. And we are so appreciative. And it's a joy to do this uh, with you, Daryl. Thank you so much for being a great co-leader. Thank you so much, Barbara. And folks, last word from me. Please, please go on to YouTube, go on to whatever you need to go to, look up Ari Melber's show from last night. If you have questions about <laughs> just Katani, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, Barbara Arnwine was on last night laying it all out. We encourage you to go out and, and check that episode out of, uh, of the Ari Melber show. Thank you, everybody. Lynn? And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this session of the Good Trouble Voting Rights Institute. We invite you to tell all your friends and your family about it and join us next week, March the 26th for another session. Thank you, Barbara and Dale, for such um, enlightenment and information that we would never hear anywhere else. And thank you all. Have a great day. Blessings. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Blessings. Oh. <laughs>